Well, hello everybody and welcome to another one of HydroTerra's webinar series. Today we've got a presentation by Neil Thompson from Senversa about managing landfill airspace optimization. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is, that's about getting more out of your landfill. So uh, working out ways to compress the waste and that sort of thing. So we get more out of the existing landfill infrastructure that we have. So a little bit, uh, there's a picture of our speaker and you, Neil's uh, geo-environmental engineer working with Senversa and I had the pleasure of working with Neil many years ago at Golder Associates. Uh, we were both working on landfill works and that side of things. A little bit more about our speaker. So Neil was educated at a university in Scotland or in Edinburgh known as the Harriet Watt University, which was named after Watt who invented the steam engine apparently. Uh, so Neil Thompson is a principal geo-environmental engineer and is currently Senversa's work group leader for the ground engineering and geotechnics teams with over 40 years ground engineering experience from the United Kingdom, Southeast Asia and Australia. Neil has broad and significant experience in delivering ground engineering components of waste management, infrastructure, land development and energy projects. Neil was formerly the engineering manager in Victoria for CleanAway and responsible for the delivery and obtaining regulatory approvals of landfill cells, which involve significant groundwater controls, earthworks, and geosynthetic lining systems. During this time, Neil performed the monthly airspace consumption assessment and fully understands what is required in constructing landfill infrastructure. In addition, Neil has directed and managed the completion of a large number of projects, including construction of landfill facilities, geotechnical and environmental site assessments, for soil and groundwater, for a diverse range of clients. So I think you'll all agree, and it's great to see so many people here, that uh, Neil has a lot of knowledge to pass on to us about landfills and how to optimise their airspace. Before we get started, just a couple of administrative matters. We love your questions and uh, certainly it's a big part of what we do in these webinars. So if you can use the Q&A button that's there and type your questions in, I will read out those questions at the end of the webinar. Thank you also for all those early bird questions. We've got about 10 of those, I think, uh, to, um, that have come in by today. So. We'll deal with those questions first and then move on to the ones that are raised during the webinar. Why does HydroTerra do these webinars? Well, we like to share knowledge and uh, I think a lot of people in the industry like to share knowledge and many thanks to Neil for sharing his knowledge today. We also think it's important to facilitate education. I think we're filling a bit of a hole in the current educational platforms that we have. And we like to talk to industry leaders and uh, understand where the market or where technology is going in the market. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, why landfills are important. You know, some people think landfills are a dirty word. I'm going to talk about uh, just the extent of our landfill network and the amount of waste that goes into them now. Um, then Neil's going to talk about waste placement optimization and why we need to do it. Then he's going to talk about waste placement optimization, how we do it. Uh, and then we'll move to part three, which is the Q and A. So let's get into it. Before we get into it, uh, if you want to know more about landfill, management. We've had quite a lot of different webinars uh, over the last sort of three years or so, uh, which you know, really do form a pretty comprehensive educational suite. 
Um, we've got one on landfill capping, which was by Dr. Brent Davey, another one on landfill leachate collection by Tyson from McKenzie Environmental. Um, we had one by Nick Simmons, which was all about landfill monitoring best practice. We had one by our own Yick, all about automated monitoring and control leachate of leachate pumping. Uh, and then we had another one on ground gas monitoring. And of course we've got today's. So all of those are available as recordings, uh, as is this one going to be, and you'll find them on our website. Okay, so landfill, an important part of waste management infrastructure. Sometimes I think we've forgotten why we have landfills. There's a lot of them, okay? And uh, in Victoria alone, we've got 92 operating landfills at present. And around the country, we've got over a thousand. Um, and a huge amount of our waste still goes into landfills. I can sort of remember back 15 years ago, we had something called the zero waste strategy, something along the lines, and we were going to be turning off waste going to landfill. Well, it's proved quite a challenge to do that. And uh, consequently, they're still a very important part of our infrastructure. Certainly management of these landfills has improved immensely um, over that last sort of 20 years or so. And uh, Neil will have seen those, those changes, but um, I'm interested to get Neil's thoughts later on on this on the uh, whether or not we're quite ready to switch landfills off because uh, certainly no sign of the amount of waste going into them reducing. So I think landfills are important. I think they're very useful and uh, we probably should be viewing them more in that way rather than you know, as something dirty. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Neil and thanks very much for Neil for joining us today. Thank you, Richard, and afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join this webinar. Well, re really, I was going to look at uh, what we prepared here at Simversa as fill plans and 3D models, and why we do that, and then how we do that. But landfill operators, when they construct a cell, they spend several million dollars in creating the cell and getting it licensed through the EPA so that it can accept waste. So it's a considerable investment. And so really it's an asset and the asset is the airspace that they have. So not only is the, the floor and the base of liner system constructed, but there's the agreed top of waste contour. So how high they're going to fill this landfill cell with waste and um, really need to optimize that space and get most, get as much a tonnage of waste in there that you possibly can uh, before you need to move on to the next landfill cell. But there are consequences if we don't keep within the uh, the boundaries that are agreed with EPA and councils, and that can be overfill. Uh, you actually go outside the boundary, be it the vertical boundary or the, the horizontal boundaries of that cell. And that can happen through poor site controls, uh, poor planning. Maybe the next cell's not ready or licensed to receive waste and there's nowhere else for the waste to go but uh, higher if uh, you can get approval from the EPA to do that. Uh, and outcomes from these inefficiencies, well, if they've got overfill, you've got to then spend money taking that overfilled waste and placing it into a licensed area. So you're double handling. You're spending a lot of money in fuel, diesel for, to, for the excavators, the trucks and the compaction equipment. Uh, there's the time as well uh, to, to haul and replace the waste. And then you, you're out of your regulatory compliance. So you tend to have the heat from the EPA uh, on your back as well. So all these things led to uh, discuss with one of our primary uh, clients uh, how we could provide 3D models that would allow the operators to keep within the, the boundaries of, uh, of their license facility. Uh, so how can we protect this valuable asset? Uh, the operational airspace is, uh, has to be fully utilized and I'll, I'll, I'll go through the difference between total airspace and operational airspace in a minute. We've got to keep waste within the approved cell boundaries. And again, as I say, horizontal and vertical boundaries 
We have to maximise the compaction during waste placement. So again, we have uh, waste coming across uh, the Weybridge so we can record the mass. And we've got to try and get that mass into as small a volume as we possibly can so that we can get even more mass into the remaining uh, airspace. But to allow us to get uh, the trucks to the actual uh, tipping point, we really need to include haul roads. And there's a whole uh, science and engineering background into the placement of haul roads, which minimises the airspace that you lose from the uh, from the total airspace that leaves you with the operational airspace. So the haul roads and the placement of haul roads to allow safe access and egress and uh, tipping uh, is critical for these uh, cells. Uh, and to do that, we also uh, adopt what's called a, a haul road management plan. And again, that's uh, an approved document that's uh, uh, listed on the EPA website and the guidelines as to how to prepare a haul road management plan. Does that need to be audited now? Or is it, uh... Uh, no, no, the whole road management plan, just an approved person uh, can prepare it that's outside of the operator, but it doesn't have to be an auditor that signs off on that. Or it, it didn't used to be, although it might be changing. <laughs> so what are fill plans? Uh, fill plans are a mixture of uh, three-dimensional and two-dimensional models. What we have uh, on the top right hand side there is a two dimensional pictorial representation of uh, a fill plan, which shows areas where the fill should be placed sequentially, so in, in the stages, which allows the, the breadth of uh, waste placement within the cell. And then the cells have uh, subsequent lifts to, to get to the top of waste contours. If you look at the, the longitudinal section at the, the bottom of the page, that's taken from AutoCAD. Uh, you can see a rather horizontal uh, surface at, at the top. We'll come back to that in a minute. But you can see the uh, maybe, hopefully, you can see a blue line at the bottom, which shows the top of the leachate collection system, which is the top surface of the as constructed um, landfill cell, which is ready then to accept waste. Uh, I tend to be quite badly colourblind, so to me that's a yellowy green, but to someone else it might be a completely different colour. But the three horizontal lines there uh, show two uh, waste lifts as it comes uh, from the floor uh, up vertically. Uh, th these are the lifts. Uh, so each lift has a fill plan, and you can see at the top there we make reference to lift six, which is from a different site. The, the volume between the two surfaces provides the total airspace within the, the cell for that lift. Uh, and then you optimize where you put the, the haul road. You can see the haul road going through the center of the, the site in the top right. Uh, and that was uh, located purely because of the large size of the site and uh, other aspects of the facility, which is to the south and to the west as shown there. Again, that was brought in from the, it's, we don't have the Sol Road right at the northern boundary, for instance, because you've got the, the slopes, the barter slopes, the perimeter barter slopes of the, the waste, which tends to be uh, typically one in five and occasionally one in three vertical to horizontal. Uh, but once you know top of waste contours and the base, you can then work out the maximum height of the, of the, the landfill and therefore you split that into the number of lifts to achieve the waste placement. Uh, however, uh, at the upper surface, there's a minimum uh, area that's considered safe for the use of uh, uh, all the plant, the uh, supervisory people, and the, the way the customer trucks bringing waste in they have to have a, a minimum area which allows safe placement and safe access and egress from the tipping points. Where do you get that guidance on the minimum area? Uh, that varies from site to site and from uh, client to client, but really it's to do with the throughput, the number of trucks that are coming in uh, per day and how frequently you don't want the trucks parking up uh, because the, 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 they've got a job to do as well. So the turnaround time from the Weybridge in to the Weybridge out is highly critical. So. Uh, the safe working area is dependent upon the number of trucks that come in every day. A smaller landfill, rural landfill, might only have 10 to 100 trucks a day. Uh, a busy uh, municipal landfill in the metropolitan area can have 800 trucks plus a day. And also you've got to think that if, uh, the time, 
Uh, some uh, landfills are open 24-7 and therefore the lighting, etc., that's required to allow uh, safe operations as well is highly critical in, the, in these the fill plans or where, it can be, where they can be placed. Uh, I think if you look right in the centre there, to the left of where it says cell 4C uh, lift 6, uh, there's to, what is to me a red line. It looks like um, a, a V heading to the northeast. That's uh, the temporary litter fences, which uh, move around to, to try and minimise litter uh, travelling off site. It's OK when you're uh, in the bottom of the landfill, because you've got the perimeter around you. Got, but as the landfill waste uh, comes up vertically and all the lifts are uh, getting complete, you're on far greater risk of wind taking litter over a greater distance. So are they placed based on the weather forecast for the day? Is that how they do that? Or... Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. And, and, and also the size of the tipping pad and the open area, et cetera. But it's also a function of how many trucks are expecting in across the Weybridge that day. Okay. Because it, uh, it, we, don't put the, we don't stop putting our bins out every day if it's rainy. <laughs> Point me off. Shall we move on? Yes, please. So, what are the inputs to fill plans? Well, we need the, the top of lift uh, surface level to meters HD, uh, the lift height, and therefore the airspace volume can that can be consumed in that lift. And that's assuming a waste density of X tons per cubic meter. Uh, the reason that we need the tons is because the, the mass is weighed uh, is measured for the weigh bridge. Uh, and then we look at how much space that gets taken up in a, a month or two months, whatever the frequency of reporting is. And then you know the number of tons coming across the Weybridge and the, and the volume that's being consumed that gives you a, a tonnage. That can tends to vary between, uh, say, about 0.85 and then up to 1.2 tons per cubic metre. So I was first very surprised when I first heard that um, that. Uh, measurement because it's very like water. So waste is floating on water, the leachate, if you will. The client then provides an estimate of the daily tonnages across the Weybridge. That's very uh, commercial and sensitive information. Uh, some people like to do the calcs themselves and some clients like uh, Simversa or the consultant to do the calcs. Based on the open area and the amount of waste coming in, we can estimate how much daily cover soils are required. Uh, that's required at the end of the day or the end of the shift so that um, you minimise windblown uh, waste, you stop odours migrating away from the site and reduces the risk of pests or vermin uh, getting to the, the waste due overnight. I've talked briefly about the hall road locations, which are pretty a key and also the tipping pad locations. So there's the open space area, which is uh, regulated by the license that you get from EPA to say the minimum uh, open area for waste, but the tipping area uh, is larger than that to accommodate the trucks and the plant, et cetera, needed to, off, um, to deposit the, the waste and also to compact it. The grade of the whole roads, that's a critical aspect and when we're designing these because we want the trucks to have safe and fluent uh, access and egress. So that tends to be uh, designed based on the type of trucks that would be delivering the, the waste to and from the site. Uh, we put a, a, a small grade on the surface of each lift to allow any storm water to shed within the area not to shed to the side uh, because the storm water that Falls on uh, open waste would be classified as leachate. I've talked about the fill filling sequence per lift, as you can see there, the stages, uh, the litter fencing. Um, but based on that, you can actually estimate how many days it will take to to um, complete that lift and before the next lift is needed, is ready. Uh, as you come up uh, vertically, you need new haul roads to to get waste to the next lift. So all of this needs to be planned in advance. In terms of that planning, Neil, like you've got the data coming in from the Weybridge, how um, what's the sort of timeliness on the forecasting of running out, or is it just eyeballed? Um, uh, you, you do it lift by lift, and uh, the, the waste operators are highly adept at this because they're always putting pressure on the engineering team to get the next cell ready and licensed. Uh, and so there's a, there's a balance uh, there. But we've seen 
progress uh, through the use of these fill plants on sites. Yeah. All right, next slide. Uh, just a quick chat on the whole road management plan. So this outlines uh, the construction and the management of the whole roads that I've alluded to earlier. The alignments per waste lift, uh, the materials that are required to form uh, the whole roads. Because remember, this is within a licensed area and to place other materials that's not coming across the way bridge into this asset, that's taking up bare space. So we want to recover as much of the um, whole roads as we can. Otherwise, it can be... Um, subject to the EPA levy, because it's a, a material that's been left in, the, in consuming volume within the cell. So we'll look at ways of how we can uh, reuse material. It's not often uh, successful uh, because occasionally the, the, the material punches into the waste and therefore you, you can't reuse it if it's actually uh, contaminated, so to speak, with, uh, with waste. What we have been doing with uh, clients is tying the whole road management plans to each financial year, and then they can uh, that helps them with their reporting. And there's a document through the EPA there, uh, 332.8, uh, which is a guideline on how to calculate the waste the waste levy uh, and allowable rebates, etc. And then there, there's a, an appendix which uh, is a good guideline uh, for the management of whole roads and the whole road materials. So the uh, material you use for your all roads has to meet your license condition for waste that can be accepted to the site, is that right? Or... Yes, uh, but generally speaking, it's, uh, it can be um, uh, bricks, broken bricks, concrete, you know, regraded concrete or, um, or uh, nondescript crushed rock, etc. And it tends to be two or three layers to form the road to make it a, an all weather road, bearing in mind that this is unsealed uh, and it does require maintenance from time to time, uh, primarily around the, uh, the, the the weather seasons. But the last thing you can have is big potholes in the haul roads because the, the, um, it can lead to punctures in the customer trucks uh, or delays in the customer trucks depositing waste and going and collecting more. And used to be in the old days you could use the leachate on these whole roads for dust suppression. Is that still the case? Uh, I think they don't particularly like the re-spraying leachate. We don't know what's in the leachate now with PFAS, etc. So some operators may, if they know what the quality of the leachate, can reuse it as dust suppression. But if you have the potential for... Um, PFAS and leachate and the wind bring it, taking air droplets away, then uh, that can be a hindrance, shall we say. So um, I think it's on a case-by-case, site-by-site basis. Do you think there's a landfill out there which doesn't have PFAS in its leachate? Uh, that's a subject for another webinar, <laughs> Richard, I'd say. All right, next slide, Neil. So uh, back in the office, in the safety and the, and the, and the weather-free uh, offices, we put together 3D models, which are for the, you saw the two-dimensional representation earlier. The 3D model is um, usually uh, prepared through the AutoCAD, and we use a, a, a sub-program called Civil 3D. I've heard others using 12D, but we, we've been using Civil 3D for quite a few years now. And we've got quite a good team of 2D and 3D modelers uh, run by Isaiah Hay uh, here at Sinversa. But um, if we know the, the, the volumes, et cetera, we can, uh, or the, the lift sizes, et cetera, then, then we can prepare these models that, that uh, suit the, uh, the site conditions. We, a lot of the clients now have their own drones and can fly a drone to get an up to the minute uh, topographical surface survey, which shows the top of the waste. We know that the, the, the lift height they're going to achieve, and therefore we know the volume that is still there to be uh, to be filled with waste. So the model's based on the, the total airspace. So that, as I said before, the pre-settlement top of waste contours, the has built cell, cell records, so the top of leachate uh, collection system tends to be the upper surface of the basal liner. Uh, Client provided either topographical or um, drone surveys. 
drone surveys are becoming more the norm now because of the, the trucks and the size of the plant and the equipment and actually the, the limited visibility for the drivers and operators of the plant. Uh, drones are far more, far safer uh, than having uh, the old-fashioned uh, topographical survey at 10 metre centres. And we also have to take into account uh, the proposed future capping. It might be a um, conventional capping designed through the, the, the EPA Victoria's BEPOM, the best uh, practice in environmental management, or it could be a, a, a phyto cap, which might be marginally thinner. All intents and purposes, it tends to be a conventional uh, geosynthetic line and soil cap that goes on the, the, the cells that we've been working with more recently. And being AutoCAD, we save these files as DWG or DXF formats, which suits uh, some of the programs that we'll come to next. So how frequently do you do this? Uh, well, it depends how quickly the, the, the lift will get consumed. Uh, so if a, if a lift's going to last three months, then, you know, maybe a month out or so, we'll start looking at the, the aerial survey if the lift was to get consumed uh, more quickly, then more frequent aerial surveys are, are required. And you can think of them um, as you get, uh, as the, the cell becomes fully consumed, uh, the, play, the plane area, the planner area, two-dimensional area at the top, uh, gets smaller and therefore the consumption speeds up per lift. Do you find there's much variance, you know, um, from what's coming in the way bridge versus the actual filling rate, like you get a lot of variance in the density. That... Uh, I think the, 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 yeah, if you've got, uh, there's been a surge in trucks coming in really quickly, then that does have a, a, an impact to, or can have an impact to the density because the, the compactor can't do as many passes backwards and forwards on the waste before the next lot of waste is, is being deposited. Makes sense. All right, next slide. So um, we, one of our clients uh, adopts the, the Trimble system. Trimble is well known for their uh, survey uh, equipment, et cetera, uh, and surveying. Um, so the waste pl placement and the compaction plant we, uh, has GPS uh, system installed. Uh, we, can, we can convert our civil 3D models, the DXF and the DWG models to these SVD, SVL and TTM uh, files, uh, which are then uploaded through a Trim uh, Trimble Business Centre, uh, dedicated, it's a portal dedicated for the client and for the, the site specific. Uh, and then the, the client contracts waste compaction through Vision Link or through uh, another programme called Propeller. The, the graphic at the bottom left there is from uh, Trimble's website, which shows that uh, from the computer, uh, the, the signals get bounced off a, a satellite, as you can see in the top right hand image, again from the Trimble website. And then that can be beamed down into the sievers on the, on the construction plant, be it a dozer or a compactor. Uh, and then they have the model, they know how to, to the, the boundaries with which they've got to uh, keep the, the waste in to allow them to still meet their uh, the license conditions and to minimise the chance of overfill. So what are you actually monitoring on the dozer? Uh, well, the dozers actually can, can measure the, the lift plan. Each lift plan can get the input into the dozer so that the operator knows the vertical height and the horizontal boundaries in which you can place or compact the waste for that day. And how many sites are actually using this sort of technology now? We know, we've, we've been working on three sites with yes. this. And I'm sure there are more. It's far more efficient. It's the, it's the risk of uh, overfill. Overfill costs a, a lot of money. It doesn't sound much if you've got to move 100 cubic metres of, of waste, but uh, just the fuel consumption, uh, labour rates, and, uh, and and the compactor, the compactor and the, and the dozers, they've got set hourly frequencies that they that um, they need maintenance, etc. So you're just burning through that time between maintenance uh, periods more quickly. 
Okay, interesting. Uh, next slide. Yeah, this, uh, uh, these are the two uh, I've just got from the uh, serving guys uh, today. Uh, on the top left is the 3D model from Civil 3D, which you can see the boundary uh, uh, batter slopes. You can see the waste as it projects from the front of the drawing to the back. Uh, and a keen eye, you can see the, the hall road as it goes from the bottom left uh, in that drawing, uh, almost eastwards, uh, uh, up a, a set gradient that suits the, the trucks. Uh, you see it more, more clearly or even clearer uh, on the image to the right, and that's from the proprietary software Propeller, where we take um, a near map image uh, of the site, and then we superimpose the model, uh, the model on top of the near map image uh, to give a projection of what this uh, lift will look like uh, in the future once it's um, uh, that lift has been fully consumed by the by waste. Okay, it's impressive. Oh, this is a. Uh, this is just a, a quick uh, reminder of what waste looks like on a landfill. Uh, we've got a, a, a dozer there with two GPS uh, Trimble uh, components on it, which uh, is taking the signal from uh, the satellite and beaming it into the cab that you can see at the bottom right there, where the operator is, is trained uh, as to how and where to place waste uh, and how frequently he needs to compact the waste and um, at least staying within the, the, the boundary constraints set by the model. I don't know if many of your, um, many of the, the audiences have ever been inside uh, any plant like, like that, but if you, if you get the, the chance, uh, grab it with both hands, because it's amazing, it's a skill. The people who are using these machines are very skillful, but their uh, visibility lines are, are very marginal. Uh, what you can actually see from uh, the cab seat, uh, it's really scary. So it, it, you put a far bit greater uh, importance on your safety when you when you know uh, what these people can see and more importantly what they can't see when you're actually on a landfill site. That's a little digression there, Richard. It's a very good one. Um, and then 3D models, well, it allows incremental airspace assessments. We compare as placed waste uh, with respect to the design fill plan for that lift. Uh, we eliminate to, within reason, uh, waste placement drift, so that's overfill or underfill. Underfill can be a, a problem for clients as well, because if uh, if you haven't got the batter slope right, and then you don't realise that until two further lifts have been completed, it's really hard to go to a perimeter of a landfill and then put waste back in. Uh, and so you don't want to lose that, uh, that asset either. So overfill or underfill is uh, particularly uh, a thing that the, the operators are keen to minimise. And uh, by getting more information, obviously, we can uh, make adjustments to the design fill plan uh, and based on waste intake or seasonal differences, etc. cetera. So the outcomes, uh, from a client's perspective, this is my uh, opinion, but the, the risk of overfill is significantly reduced. Uh, we have reduced labour, plant and fuel costs and uh, impact on time. A far better understanding of airspace consumption rates uh, and leading to increased uh, compaction rates, which then you can build into the longevity of subsequent cells. Uh, we have a better understanding of the volume of cover soils that are required. And that, that's a... That is a, a minefield, to be honest. You think you're just putting 300 mil or 100, no, 300 millimetres of cover soils uh, on every day, uh, unless you use an alternative system. But it's a colossal volume of material goes in there and it consumes airspace. So getting that right is, is critical. And it's something that we're, we're, we're all working on. As I say, we aid uh, the planning for future cells, the budget and the timing of when the, 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 the next cell needs to be open and licensed to receive waste. And the operators can have a more accurate prediction of whole of life model. When will that whole landfill facility be fully consumed by waste? And this is 
they, they undertake these on a year-on-year -year annual plan, well, year-on-year -year annual, there's a superfluous word in there, uh, planning events. And we try to better estimation of what materials will be left in there from haul roads and minimising any EPA levy. Uh, an apology to any regulators that might be listening today. Uh, we hope that that leads to a happy and a less stressed client, uh, engaged staff and the operations team, uh, and potentially lowers the risk of an inquisitive regulator who may, uh, on an audit, notice that uh, if we have uh, uh, overfill at a certain area, for instance. So minimise these things and we want to work in harmony with not only uh, themselves where they can maximise profit, but also the local communities where these landfills are sited. So just uh, on that EPA levy side of things, so what does that discussion look like with, with the regulator about that? Uh, I'll be honest here, and uh, I haven't been involved in that uh, myself, but I know that the operators are when they have to do their uh, uh, their statements, their annual statements, and that's why we try and link the whole road management plans to the financial year, so therefore it's, um, it makes it easier for their volumes, etc., that may still be in the landfill and consuming airspace that they may or might have to pay levy on. The goal is to... Is to um, reuse the, the whole wood materials as much as it's practical, uh, but there's usually a little bit of loss into the landfill, or can be. So they pay a levy because it's using up airspace? I believe so. Okay. But, uh, I'm, I'm open to discussing that with anyone uh, who had better knowledge than I have. Okay. So, Neil, that was fantastic. And uh, thanks for putting together a few takeaways. I've added a couple of my own into this, but certainly um, really good to hear these practical approaches to improving how we operate in this area. So the key takeaways, by managing waste placement, we can optimise the amount of waste that can be placed in our existing landfill infrastructure. And with the restrictions that we have at the moment on getting new landfill landfills up, um, that's becoming more and more valuable. By embracing digital technology, significant efficiencies and cost savings can be made to landfill operations. I think we saw that particularly with that Trimble network. Can reduce overfill and therefore reduce rework. Optimise the location of haul roads and better utilise the operational airspace. We can better predict when the next cell is required to be licensed and ready to accept waste. We can predict the volumes of materials required for operations, particularly cover soils, haul road construction and tipping bed, pad materials. We can also predict when material will be required. And we can produce better cost modelling for client, for whole of life models. So without further ado, oh, there was a couple of other things that, Neil, uh, would you like to talk to this, given your oh, this is just the a, organising committee? Just a, a, a free plug. Uh, Richard and I are on the organising committee for this uh, Australian Landfill and Transfer Stations Conference in Melbourne uh, towards the end of June, which we're looking forward to. Uh, and on day one of the conference, there'll be two workshops, one on landfill gas, but the second's on... Uh, uh, optimising airspace. It's being run by uh, John Jones, who's uh, Cleanaways New South Wales landfill manager, and that promises to be really interesting. Uh, and so I'd advise people uh, who are interested uh, to to get along or at least seek out the um, the conference on Wammer's website and see if you can come along because it should be a really good three days. And it's being held in Melbourne. Mm. Uh, while we're on free plugs, if you want to sign up for the next uh, webinar, there'll be a link on this presentation or in the chat of, uh, of this uh, Zoom presentation.
All right, we've got a fair few Q&A questions uh, building up. So if you're ready, Neil, we're going to charge into them. Yes, no problem. <laughs> Good to hear you're ready. First oh, question, really? can you break down between regular waste streams and emergency waste streams, e.g. fire, floods, impact on land, fill? Uh, yes, yes and no. Well, the regular waste streams is, is your day-to-day -day, uh, that's coming in through the, the Weybridge and the, the operators work really hard to get to, to sell that one, fill space to clients, etc. So, uh, But the emergency wastes, well, we, we can never predict these uh, fire or floods. Uh, again, there's a, there's, there's a balance about um, helping the community. The prime importance is to help the community through periods of difficulty with um, whether the landfill is licensed to take such uh, materials. If you, if you think of fire, uh, houses, etc., some may have um, asbestos in the fibre sheeting, which you can't uh, take to all landfills. Uh, and then in floods, then the, the waste tends to be very saturated, which makes it very difficult to compact uh, uh, and also increases the, the potential for leachate within the landfill. But everyone has to come together. And they, they, these emergency waste, we've seen um, DECA, formerly DELT, uh, leading, leading in that in, in certain areas. So it's really, really difficult. You've got to help the community when you can. Um, importantly, more recently, what we've seen is the, the health industry. When um, the amount of waste from the, the health industry through COVID, uh, particularly the two years of, of lockdown, uh, the disposable uh, PPE, et cetera, uh, that tended to go to, to some of the larger landfills before the, their, um, their new facilities are up and running that can actually deal with that outside of the landfill stream. Uh, and that ended up being termed deep burial. And what happens there is that truckloads of the, the, this waste would come in and there'd be an excavator to dig into uh, an area that had been set aside for deep burial, uh, and they could then bury the, the waste at, at depth and backfill it with more uh, more recent waste and conventional waste in the landfill. And that, that happened for quite a little bit. If you can think of you know, how much uh, we threw out in the bins after doing our tests, et cetera, and the, and the face masks, but from uh, the health industry, the hospitals and the, and the aged care facilities, there was a colossal volume of waste that had to be managed. And that colossal volume of waste, not just from that, but, but these fires and floods, is, is that affecting, uh, I guess, policy in, with respect to you know, opening up additional landfills that maybe they wouldn't have done? <clears throat> Oh, you, you definitely see the need for those, uh, uh, but you, you can't really overly predict where the next uh, serious incident is going to occur. And so what, what facilities are local uh, to you? But it, it's, it's, I think it's a question that's not going to be answered at the, during this conversation, but it's a very interesting one. Uh, and and then I'll, I'll come to later the alternative waste treatment uh, facilities aren't up and running as yet, particularly here in Victoria. And so landfills are, are here to stay and serve a purpose. Very good. Next question, which would be the most optimal method or tool to survey the depth and extent of an unlined landfill? Well, from, from the question, an uh, unlined life landfill would tend to be quite an old landfill, so it's been uh, in place for a long period of time. Uh, there's a lot to be said for a desktop study. You can uh, There are people that hold, or uh, places that hold aerial photographs, so any aerial photographs that you can have of the site would be uh, really worthwhile. Uh, if we know it's online, then uh, it's better. You don't want to be doing any intrusive investigation and puncturing through the, the basal liner. Uh, talking to people, if, if there are still people around that actually worked or knew of the landfill, uh, people that had actually surveyed the landfill in the past. We know um, one surveyor who's famous all over Victoria. And he just has so much knowledge of landfills from years and years and years ago. 
But if you have to do an intrusive investigation, what I've seen uh, been undertaken not that long ago uh, successfully was to actually use a, a piling rig to actually drill through uh, the waste. You, you just don't know what you're going to find in the waste. Old car bodies, big lumps of metal, lots of timber, etc. And your conventional geotechnical uh, drilling methods are probably not good enough to, uh, to get through some of the waste. And by, by stopping on, say, concrete or, or some obstruction, uh, you may not be able to prove the depth of the online landfill or the waste within the online landfill. So we've seen the, the use of piling rigs, which is costly, but we've seen that used successfully in the past. That was a, a, a competitor consultancy did that. Um, what about geophysics? Now, have you used that? Well, I think geophysics. I'm not sure if it'll go to the depths. You think you know, waste might be twenty meters plus deep. I'm not sure if geophysics would go that depth, nor would it get through maybe a steel plate or something like that, where the where the, the signal would refract or reflect. Uh, so I'm not too sure if geophysics uh, would go, would get the depth that you really need. There's no harm in chatting to a geophysics person, but that can be costly too, but not as costly as a piling rig. Thought seismic might be a good application there. Um, next question. What has been your experience with Verdac and Posi Shell as daily cover? Um, well, it's a very short answer to this one. I don't have any experience with, with those, but I've seen um, the the spray on cover being used successfully uh, on one landfill. Pardon me. I've also seen a, a system called a tarpomatic, like a geotech style uh, cloth that's spread and rolled out over the waste uh, overnight and then rolled up again in the morning. But these are all these all form part of um, a system of uh, cover systems called alternative daily cover systems (ADCs), uh, and they tend to only be used in trial format uh, before the regulator, the EPA in Victoria, in this instance, uh, signs off that you can use them for a longer period of time. But the the time for the trial does uh, is usually quite substantial. Uh, and therefore, um, it does give you some background because the consumption of uh, and looking for uh, daily cover soils, the, the old daily cover soils, that's consuming landfill and uh, airspace and um, would probably be a better use for that material elsewhere. So I see the need for ADCs personally, uh, but I've never been in, uh, involved with a project that actually uh, looked or assessed them. So, uh, I've, I've heard of long-term trials with EPA. I don't think I've heard of one get in, uh, fully signed off by EPA. The trial continues. Why do they need to be trialled? Like, it seems fairly common sense. Uh, I think it's, it's just an old tried and tested uh, soil cover system is, is effective mm -hmm. to, to minimise odour, uh, aeolian litter, uh, or... Um, uh, vermin, the, the, the thought of, um, you know, vermin getting in overnight or breed, and then breeding, you know, generating more vermin. Yeah. Okay. Question number four. Any experience with the use of landfill lids for daily cover? Uh, I, I wasn't quite sure what was meant by landfill lids, but I've only, as I said before, been you seen tapomatic used and the spray on cover used and that's been quite successful when you 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 only need it for overnight and then you can take you know, the, the spray on system uh, is very thin so it's not consuming much in the way of airspace and the tapomatic you can roll up uh, again in the morning but I'm not sure uh, I'll show my ignorance here in public I'm not sure what is meant by a landfill lid I'm happy to take uh, a question from the author of that, if the, through the email address later, but I'm um, sorry I can't answer that here and now. Or if anyone else out there can clarify, just put it in the Q&A, that would be great. Next question, compactor size is bigger, better? Uh, yes, but it tends to consume more diesel. Uh, I, I had a fresh look at the Caterpillar website today and they had three uh, compactors there, the, the smaller of the three 
uh, tends not to get as, uh, be as effective with uh, with compaction and getting compaction to depth. So therefore, you need to place your waste in thinner layers to get the compaction, which is not efficient. Uh, the middle compactor shown there was the Goldilocks compactor. That was the one that uh, tended to be uh, used more frequently uh, on sites. And you, it's got bigger wheels and bigger power, so you, you get a greater depth of compaction per, uh, per uh, pass. So a pass being every time the, the compactor rolls or drives forward and back over the waste. Okay, so bigger is better. Next question. Have drones been used to monitor fugitive methane from legacy landfills? Uh, again, a, a woolly answer from me on this one. Uh, I would guess so. I've, I've seen um, methane monitors that can attach to drones uh, and uh, for, for in the waste space, but I've only seen them uh, the sales um, sales people at conferences, etc. But I, I, I would. From that, I would imagine that it has been undertaken in the past. Yeah, it definitely has. Um, and we've been involved with some suppliers that provide uh, vehicle mounted monitors that you can drive oh, yeah. or your landfill cap, and it'll give you a GPS reading and, uh, and your methane concentration. So, this is for your sort of fugitive methane on the cap surveys that you'd otherwise be doing on foot. Um, and then Grazia out of, um, sorry Grazia, I can't remember the name of your company, um, has airborne um, drones mm. that have sensors attached to them. I know they mm. provide that as a service. So it, it does happen. Mm. Um, Do, um, does the I'm going to turn the question on you, Richard, and ask you a question then on, on that. If, if, if they're mounted to vehicles, is there a minimum or a maximum speed that the vehicle can go with to keep the the, the reading uh, suitable or appropriate or acceptable? And uh, what about um, any fugitive emissions from exhaust from diesel vehicles? Would that pick up as methane? Uh, I think the vehicle-mounted one, um, which was actually one that was out of a company out of um, New Zealand, Air Quality Limited. It was an electrical uh, sort of golf buggy vehicle. So it didn't ah, have right. yeah. issues with the emissions. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the maximum speed, well, it's probably more a safety thing now, but I'm actually not sure what the maximum speed is. <laughs> um, but if it got airborne, it'd be affecting the errors. Um, I'm really not sure. I guess there's a certain period of time for it to actually uh, compute that reading, mm. um, but I'm not sure on that bit. It certainly gives you a better resolution than what you get walking around. Whether yeah. you need that better resolution, well, it depends a bit on your aim, right? If you're meeting a regulatory compliance requirement or whether you're really looking to find out if there are any leaks at all through your cap. It's probably part sure. of it too. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, you're not meant to ask me questions now. <laughs> um, next question, number seven. Can HDPE landfill liners disintegrate or break down when exposed to weather? If so, what can be done to avoid that? Yeah, uh, well, the answer is yes to that. But typically, the the, the liners tend to have a, a protection layer of geotextile over the top of them, which uh, tries to minimise any impact from uh, UV through light, etc. But also in designs, the the geote the protection geotextile would have to be covered by a protective soil layer within a given time, so that uh, that given time then wouldn't allow the HDPE being exposed for, um, for long enough that it would disintegrate. How long is that typically? Oh, you put me on the spot here. Um, it tends to be in months rather than years. Okay. So you it can be hard if, you, if you've got a long slope, a perimeter slope, say, uh, it, uh, 
it, it can be quite a long time before that can be covered because of the speed with which the waste is placed and therefore comes uh, the, the airspace getting consumed. But um, our designs tend to cover that. I'm not. I mean, the, the, our as in the industry designs cover that. So do you put temporary cover across the membrane? Yeah, te temporary cover and um, uh, but a uh, geotextile protection layer as well. Okay. Then you could ask a question about the geotextile geotextile protection layer being exposed to UV, and then that's the reason why uh, soil has to be placed within a set period. And do they then get to harvest that later, or that's just sacrificial? You sort of oh, that's that's sacrificial. That's that, that's uh, that's that's buried. That's included in the cost of uh, construction of a cell. Okay. Hmm. Next question. How? Then you've probably sort of covered this, but how does one calculate the solid waste volume of airspace in a cell? We, we get the as-built drawings of the leachate collection system, which is the, the, the surface uh, layer of the basal liner system. There's also the top of waste contours pre-settlement that are uh, embedded within the license for that cell. So you know the, um, the, the upper surface being the top of waste pre-settlement, you know the basal uh, surface, and so you can calculate in a 3D uh, program such as uh, using AutoCAD and Civil 3D, you can then estimate that solid uh, waste volume between the two surface layers. And you can uh, you can apply that to, to the, the, the volume of uh, each lift. So it's really just the volume uh, between two surface layers, uh, but the upper surface layer being the top of waste piece settlement and the lower surface layer being the um, Asbel leachate collection system. With your um, leachate collection system, and you, you put your drainage layer down on top of your membrane and then over the top of that, you put some kind of a protection for your geotextile. How much, how much do you typically put on top of that to protect it before you start running vehicles over that layer? Uh, the, we used to talk, when I was at the, in a former life at Cleanaway, it would be a couple of metres of a, a, a looser layer. It, it wouldn't be compacted. You wouldn't put the compactor on until you had two metres across the floor, and that gave that protection that anything that was compacted wouldn't punch through the uh, into the leachate collection system. And the reason that there's a geotextile on top of the aggregate to collect the, the leachate, that's to try and minimise any waste getting into the leachate aggregate system and then uh, reducing the pore space between the bits of gravel that form the leachate collection system. So that's a lot, isn't it? Like, yeah, that's why it's so expensive to put the, 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 these, the cells cost millions of dollars to, to, to build. So that looser material is that that's not waste, that's um, some other... Oh, no, it, it tends to be waste, but if you if you if your sales team knows what waste stream is coming in, so you wouldn't be putting concrete and bricks and, uh, and wood or timber, et cetera, anything hard that could punch through uh, the, the lining system, but you would put a, a lighter waste that would come in, be it soil, for instance, could be a good one. But you wouldn't want clay because then you'd get perched uh, leaching. So yeah. it, it's a balance about getting the right material. But it tends to be, uh, uh, we used to call it a fluff layer. Uh, and uh, that probably leads to some of the longer term settlements because it's not fully compacted and therefore can compact with 20 odd metres of waste above it. That, that mass of waste will, will close up that lower layer as well. Do you think that's a significant problem, perching of leachate? Uh, I think it happens, but you, you can't get around it. It just depends what goes into your um, your landfill. What are the materials going in? Yeah. But if you think about water, water, water will find a way. 
uh, if you've ever done any drainage in the back garden, etc., water finds its own way. It doesn't go where you want it to go, so I'm sure leachate will do the same within the landfill. That's a good answer now. Okay, um, next question. Does the speaker have any experience with his optimization of landfill space in dealing with differential sediment slash subsidence challenges for final services that might be planned for high quality playing fields, while many landfills end up rehabilitated for passive open space uses, there is an increasing need to utilise these valuable areas for more sensitive uses, such as high quality playing fields, where even minor differential sediment would represent an unacceptable risk. Can landfill space optimization dovetail with future land use? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one there. And I know exactly what the, the author's talking about. Uh, uh, when the kids were playing footy, junior footy, I would help out and I could be a, the goal umpire. And I remember at one ground that will remain nameless at Montmorency, uh, the, the, the other goal umpire at the far end, uh, I could only see from his waist up because they'd bounded the, the centre of the oval with so much material so that the stormwater could shed to the, the perimeter really quickly. You could only see the waist up of the other goal umpire. Anyway, I'm digressing. Uh, there's, um, when a landfill is uh, completely, uh, all the airspace has been fully consumed uh, and the capping has been constructed over the top, there's uh, usually a period of anything up to 30 years where they have to have ongoing monitoring. Uh, initially, there'll be the potential to extract landfill gas, so you need that infrastructure all, uh, across the cap. Uh, and also they have to maintain uh, a leachate level uh, at 300 millimetres or so. So within the, the leachate collection system and no leachate within the, the waste mass. That tends to mean that there's um, infrastructure in the landfill, so there could be wells where they extract leachate, which means there's a pump down the well, and the pump needs maintenance every three months or so, uh, and the extraction of gas, and that might last for 20 years plus. So in the longer term, uh, yes, they could be converted into playing fields, but in the shallow term, there's a lot of infrastructure required to maintain and manage what's already in the landfill. What we're seeing um, elsewhere is not into high quality playing fields, but public open spaces. And down in the, the sand belt, down Clayton Way, they're doing a really good job with the capping of a, a landfill that I hold dear to me at Victory Road. Uh, they've got awfully dog park area. They've got lots of walking tracks and outdoor gym for, for people that are running around these walking tracks, etc. So they are turning the, the landfill cap back into a public open space and, a, and an amenity for the public. But uh, to have it uh, used directly as a playing field the day that the, the capping has been signed off, I think that uh, I think that may be a bit, uh, uh, a bit too early, I think, because you've got to manage the, the, the landfill gas and the leachate. In effect, you've got a cap on top of a basal liner and you've got, you've got a little pressure cooker in there and there's still a lot of chemical reactions going on. Uh, the weight and the mass of that, of that material, if you think we've said that the densities can be about 0.85 to 1.2 tonnes per cubic metre, so not, not much uh, difference from water. That material will continue to um, settle through self-weight uh, over a, a period of time, which could be 10, 20 years as well. So you would still have that same uh, problem. What they could do, I suppose they could um, uh, build that into the capping system, uh, but to have no differential settlement or no settlement, I think would be unwise for anyone to say that that would happen in the, in the near term. It's, um... And it's, a, it's also a cost to the, the landfill uh, operator. So if it was council, rates would have to go up to accommodate that, or the landfill fees would have to go up for, by a private operator. And if they were taking municipal waste, then the rates would go up again. So there's a cost implication for further engineering uh, caps. And do you really think that 30 years is based on anything technical, or is it more? I mean, it seems like a very arbitrary number. 
uh, is an arbitrary number, but I think I think is it twenty years or so the the, the return on landfill gas extraction diminishes. Twenty years or so, uh, it's a very, it'll vary from site to site. There's a there's a site um, I know from the past which was a solid inert site and it was still generating landfill gas years and years and years after it closed. Yeah, so. it just needs some. Um, Organic material, mulch, garden waste, etc., to have been uh, included in a, a few, a few um, loads, and you've got something that's going to be breaking down over years within the landfill. Uh, we better keep moving. Um, we're about five minutes over. Are you happy to keep going for another ten minutes or so? Be good to yeah, yeah, no, not too bad. Not too... Thanks very much for that. Next question. Are you concerned about landfills running out of airspace before energy from waste facilities are ready? Uh, personally, no, not in the near term. We've got some energy from waste facilities uh, in the planning stage here in uh, Victoria. And generally speaking, uh, from the very beginning through to operational might take about 10 years or so. Uh, we still, uh, in the southeast, uh, the sand belt, those landfills are all full now, uh, but there are some larger uh, waste transfer stations constructed to allow trucks to take waste that are um, uh, deposited at a transfer station to a, a landfill. So I, I can see landfills being here for a, a long time yet. And some of the larger ones now, the mega landfills over in the, the, the western side of uh, Melbourne and in the north, uh, they've got years and years of air space still. It will tailor off as the energy from waste facilities get up and running, uh, but in the near term, uh, talking 10 years or so, then uh, I can see landfills being here to stay. Probably be retired by then now. So okay. yeah, 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 within 10 years, I'd say thank you, Richard. Yeah. All right, under the Q&A. Oh, here's the, one, here's the ones I haven't been able to prep. That's right. You're in all sorts now. Uh, <laughs> anonymous attendee. Love the sources and links in the presentation. Will the presentation be shared so we can click on some of these links? Yes, uh, all the presentations go on to the HydroTerra website. If you click on the About Us tab, I think it is, you'll find a webinars section there and in there are all the recordings so typically we get the recording up just about midday on monday uh, so if you go looking for it then it'll be there for you next question are there any landfills with plant that operate driverless uh not intentionally that i'm aware of <laughs> okay. that's not coming i think uh, you might see alternative fuels to diesel be in, uh, in the plant before the, the uh, remote, but you never know. We, th we said that about the mining industry not that long ago, and look at the mining industry now. Yeah, made the lawnmowers in your backyard, man. Um, next question, Warren Pump. Hello, Warren. Does your modelling expressly account for site-specific secondary compression of the compacted waste? Do the overfilling contours take account of the inevitable subsidence of waste over a period of years, say three to five years after placement of final capping? If so, the overfill contours can be predetermined to allow for a future beneficial use of the rehabilitated landfill. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question, but the um... It's, it's a bit of a gamble if it doesn't if it doesn't uh, settle within that uh, that time. But I, I have seen uh, uh, that actually happen in one landfill where it was uh, there was a little bit of overfill, shall we say, and it uh, it um, it uh, didn't result in longer term overfill. There's a famous uh, landfill in New South Wales which was so deep that the um, the volume or the mass of the waste coming in in one year period uh, imposed enough settlement to be uh, uh, airspace neutral. So they had the same airspace at the end of the year as they had at the, the beginning. 
Uh, and so therefore it was like a magic pudding. Uh, no matter what you put in, the settlement took out uh, enough airspace for you to have it open for a, a, a subsequent year. Okay. Uh, thanks for that question, Warren. Next question from Nadia Chowdhury. Any measure to identify groundwater interception into the clay line cells, which is finally ending in the leachate dam? So the, the intersection of, of groundwater with the clay cells to, that would then interact with leachate? Yeah, it's, I think... Um, Uh, the, and the, the older the older um, landfills and the sand belt, uh, groundwater table is artificially lowered by 12 to 20 metres uh, to allow the, the sands to be uh, quarried or mined uh, and sold off and therefore that turned into uh, landfill. And to maintain the landfill, there was a long-term dewatering system in place and so that when the, the landfill was full, they could switch the pumps off and then groundwater would then uh, recover to the regional levels. But uh, new landfills uh, tend to be designed where the lowest point of the of the cell, which tends to be uh, the base of the sump, uh, that needs to be two metres, uh, a two metre buffer zone between the base of the sump and the the regional uh, or the, the local groundwater table. And so that interaction shouldn't shouldn't occur. Certainly some um, older landfills that I can think of that yeah. you do. The, the, the older landfills also might not have had, uh, you know, uh, uh, wall liners. And therefore, when groundwater rebounds to its uh, more regional level, then that will definitely uh, intermix with any leachate that happens to be in the landfill cell or still remaining there. And one way to do this would be a water balance where you could calculate yeah. infiltration. I think even just on the, the water monitoring, though, the, the longer term water monitoring, you can see any movement in certain uh, metrics or parameters uh, that would indicate. Uh, and then finding out who, who is the guilty culprit of the impact to groundwater could be difficult if you're in an area of uh, formal industry, for instance. Yeah, I think this is more about it coming the other way, groundwater ingress into the cells. Mm. We better move on. Next question. Also from Nadia, sneaking in an extra one. Uh -huh. Is landfill sediment considered in determining the final waste level the overfilling will provide further airspace before the cells are rehabilitated. It's a bit like Warren's. Well, I think it's, it's all in the terminology that the, the, the design of the landfill is to the, the top of waste pre-settlement contour. So it's to a, a, a level that's be, before settlement occurs. And so therefore, uh, longer term, uh, the surface will be below the top of waste pre-settlement contours, you would imagine. So uh, maybe going back to Warren's uh, question too, so maybe there's, there's, a, there's opportunity to, to actually, uh, we wouldn't call it overfill in this instance, but um, there is the opportunity if, uh, if you could realistically predict what the longer term settlement was going to be, but that's a function of the material going into the landfill and so the heterogeneity of that material makes it uh, a lot more difficult to predict than it would do for longer term settlements of soils, for instance. Uh, next one's uh, from Ross McFarland. I think he's fessing up to that tricky earlier question. Um, but thanks, Neil. I appreciate your sharing of your acquired wisdom. Thanks for that, Ross. Um, William Dillon. Looks like the last question of the day, I think. What is the thickest or deepest waste mass you have come across? Uh, I think going back to that uh, site in New South Wales, I'm sure that's about, uh, and I'll get shot down here, I'm sure that was 90 metres of, of waste. Manningly Brown Coal had a really thick... Uh, ah, 
I have never worked on that, that site. But I, I, I'm not saying that uh, there are not deeper ones out there, but that was definitely beyond nine, uh, 60, and I'm sure it was 90 metres deep. Um, okay, there's two things in the chat. Uh, there's a link to the webinar next week. And I think that's all. So, Neil, thanks very much for participating today. No problem. And uh, it's been it's been great to hear your knowledge there. And thanks also to all the attendees. It's been great to have so many people here to listen to Neil. So look forward yeah. to seeing you at our next webinar. Thanks, Richard. Thanks everyone for joining, and thanks for your questions. All right. right. Thanks for that. And bye. Bye. For all. Now. Bye.